सर्वेभ्यो नम अद्यतन कार्यक्रम अचिराद आरप्स्यते सर्वान् भवन परतस्थिता अभ्यर्थ आगत सभा स्वानी आसना गृंडंती देशन इज गोयिंग टू स्टार्ट वेरी सून विथ इन फोर आर फाइव मिनिट्स ई रिक्वेस्ट पीपल हू आर् अरउंड द आडिटोरियम टू कम इन एंड टेक् देर सीट्स थैंक यू सर्वेभ्यो नम सुप्रभात ई वेलकम यू आल टू दर्ड डे आफ् एन एफ एस ई टू थैंटीन टूडे इन द फस्ट सेशन वी हेव प्रोफेसर नारायण श्रीनिवासन टू डेलीवर की नोट अड्रस् रिक्वेस्ट डॉक्टर नारायण श्रीनिवासन टू कम आन दस एंड टेक् सीट so here is a brief introduction to the speaker uh, professor narayanan srinivasan is an eminent cognitive scientist 
with a background of physics and electrical engineering having a master degree specializing in uh, bio signal processing from indian institute of science he joined university of georgia for for his uh, phd where he investigated the interaction between attention and spatial frequency processing mechanism he has a number of research papers to his credit several of several of which uh, demonstrate the impact of meditation on various as aspects of consciousness such as attention memory and retrieval he joined cbcs center for behavioral and cognitive sciences alhabad in 2003 and currently he is the head of the same he uses an empirical approach to study the cognition and consciousness several of his phd students work on the different aspects of uh, uh, cogn uh, cognition such as attention memory retrieval and other related uh, topics we are honored to have you sir here and uh, i request you to deliver your keynote address on the topic experience of time thank you Yeah, first I would like to thank uh, everybody at Chinmaya University, especially Dr. Shilpa, I, I don't know where she is. Uh, okay, you are at the back. Okay. <laughs> uh, and everybody for inviting me. Um, you know, over two days I realized I am an outlier in this conference. Uh, I do not do qualitative work. Uh, I do science. A uh, lot of these things have been kind of trashed over the past two days. Uh, and I want to make an argument that uh, you can study or we should try to study um, whatever we want to study about us, uh, anything that we want uh, using science. Uh, when you make a choice of different methodologies, whether it is quantitative, mathematical, statistical, qualitative, you are really making a choice. Of course, every methodology has some advantages, has some disadvantages. Uh, every method can give you something, but not everything. So, if you want, for example, causal explanations of phenomena in nature, then I don't think you're going to simply do it by doing only qualitative research. It's not possible. It's a limitation of the methodology. Similarly, if you do qualitative research, it's good, you can get some information, but ultimately you are making a choice of languages. If essentially, if you do qualitative research, you are simply saying that I am happy with whatever is provided by the kind of languages we already use, English, Tamil, Sanskrit. If you do science, as somebody famously said, uh, what you find is the, I mean, let me quote the phrase, unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. And mathematics is also, was also done in classical India as well. So, there is no reason for us to shun away from mathematics. Uh, one of the things that happens, especially in social science research, is that people are told to kind of stay away from mathematics. In fact, a lot of choices are made based on, I really don't like mathematics. That is for people who do physics or chemistry. And I will do psychology or sociology or whatever it is. Uh, and then, I don't want to do mathematics. So, Mathematics is very effective and uh, we will see. The third component is experimentation. While we cannot do experiments freely outside, we can do experiments in the laboratory. And these two things are not mutually exclusive of each other. Again, each give you different kinds of information and you can build a coherent story only when, only when you have all those things in place. Okay? with that kind of preamble. Um, I'm going to talk about time. Uh, I will start with our experience of time. I will kind of shift uh, to uh, 
the second part which is a shorter part uh, and I will talk about consciousness with some emphasis on time as well. Okay. Um, please stop me if you have any questions in between. It is okay if I do not cover all the slides. Uh, I probably have more than what is needed. I will talk about four aspects with respect to experience of time. Okay. And they are listed there, but all of us experience time. As I was telling somebody, time is a bit peculiar due to multiple reasons. One reason is that if you are familiar with perceptual theories in Indian philosophy as well, there is a lot of talk about sense organs. Do we have a sense organ for time, exclusively for time? We have eyes for vision, presumably. We have ears for audition. We have skin. But what about time? It is something we perceive though. All of us have sat enough in, since this is an academic setting, boring lectures which never seem to end and time passes very slowly and sometimes you are involved in your activities so much time flies and you simply say, oh, it's just time passed very quickly. I am sure all of you have had this experience. If you have not had this experience, raise your hand, <laughs> right? So all of us experience time. It is something that we experience, something we can we even talk about. So the question is, how does it happen? And I am not going to talk about everything that we know about experience of time, but important thing is even any kind of experience that you have, whether it is a visual experience or an auditory experience or actually a kind of unified experience that you have happens in a subjective timeline. It happens in time. As in physics, we say time has a, di a direction, right? There is past, present and future. You do not have it for space. Space is just, there is no direction to space, right? And our ability to perceive time, it plays an important role in lots of things we do. Right? Uh, there was an announcement made, the talk is going to start in 4 or 5 minutes. It is again about time. Right? Whenever we start studying something as a science, the first question invariably comes is, how are you going to measure it? Because if you are not going to be able to measure something, then it is almost impossible to do anything with it. So the question is, how do we measure your experience of time? So what I have put is uh, not exactly the only methods, but three common methods that we use to study how people experience time. Uh, let me go through them. It is methodological, but many of you may not be familiar with this. The first method is kind of an obvious method. It is called verbal estimation. The basic idea is simple. I say show you a video or a picture for some time and then I ask you, you know, how much time do you think passed and I ask you to give actually a number. Okay. Now it sounds like how will people can do it? The answer is people can do it reasonably well. It is not that people give accurate numbers. We are not interested in that. In fact, there is a difference between what you can measured by a clock, the objective time and what people report subjectively. Okay. They do not match, but that is not important, but people can do this and we can use this information effectively to study how we experience time. The second method is reproduction. So essentially again I can show you a video, say for I do not know, some 10 seconds and then I can say that well, whatever time that you experienced, you just, you know, usually you can do it as say start, you just wait for that much amount of time and then you say stop. Okay? It is essentially a reproduction of the same duration, uh, typically used for very longer durations, not for shorter durations, but it is something that is commonly used uh, and we have used as well. The third method is a more what is called a psychophysical method. Uh, it is called bisection. Uh, the idea is simple that if you are going to present certain stimuli or objects on the screen for certain amounts of time, it will 
span a range of time, say one second to two seconds. Now, what you do is you train participants to say that, well, what is one second? This is how much it lasts. What is two seconds? This is how much it lasts. So that people are aware of the endpoints. Then you can present any stimulus for any duration in between and then ask them, is it closer to the short one or the long one? Now it becomes what we normally call a two alternative first choice task. Okay? So now you are making a choice between two alternatives. This duration, is it closer in my experience to that one or this one? People can do this and with that you can construct a, math, a curve which we can use to study. Okay? And I will show you an example of this as well as we move on. So these are three reasonably common methods that is used in studying our experience of time in the literature. Now, as I said, our experience of time is exactly not the same as what you say your clock will tell you, right? So, a lot of factors influence our experience of time. As some are listed here. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, if you are interested, we can look at them. So, for example, this is temporal factors something about speed of stimuli, how quickly something is moving, whether something is moving, whether something is flickering, the size, whether it is an object or not, whether how big of an object it is or small an object of it is, all of these things affect our experience of time. Okay? These are not things that I study too much personally, but uh, they are there. What is on this side are things that I do study uh, and we will look at some of them. Intentions, our own intentions uh, influence how we experience time and I will show you an example of it. How a particular object or a piece of information is associated with us, with you could call it self, that affects or you go whatever terminology you want to use, that also influences time and I will show you an example of this. And how we pay attention also influences our time. There are a lot of studies on how attention influences our experience of time. I will go through one of them. Okay. Now, there is a particular hypothesis. It is a bit abstract, but I have put it for people who are interested in philosophy. Um, there is something called a structure ma matching thesis. It was actually uh, kind of explicitly given by Ian Phillips, who is a philosopher. Um, let me just read the quote. The way we go about trying to answer the question concerning the temporal structure of our conscious experience is by making a judgment about the temporal structure of the apparent objects of consciousness and then by taking our experience to be structured in the same way. Now, um, I'm not going to talk about all the implications of this, but the basic idea is this, right? Time is peculiar in way. Experience happens in time and in effect, we also experience time. So, for example, take color. We experience color, but we will not say experience happens in color, right? It, it doesn't work that way. But time is one where you, you can say it both ways. I am experiencing something in time, okay, as well as I experience time as well. Okay. So, this makes time a bit unique when it comes to other perceptual experiences that we have. Now, uh, various models of time perception and there are many models that are currently available in the literature and I will describe two or three very briefly. Um, they do not talk, well, or at least our criticism is that they do not very well take phenomenology or experience into account. Okay? And I, I will tell you in what way. And what we really want to show is this, what this needs is a change in felt time solely by a change in experience, but we would like to say even without change something out there, okay? whatever an object out there. How do we actually study this? Well, oh sorry. 
We study this using uh, something called an Ecker cube. Um, I was just actually showing it to uh, one colleague here yesterday. Um, many of you may have seen this in the maybe undergraduate textbooks or websites. If you keep looking at this cube, and you can do that yourself, it will change its orientation automatically, right? And what will, if you keep, if you have enough time, say five minutes, and you keep looking at this, then what you will get is a time series like this. It will keep changing. The duration for which a particular orientation that you experience is not constant. It's variable. In fact, we can show it's actually a nonlinear dynamic time series. And this experience that you have is interesting because, at least for us who study experience in the lab, visual or perceptual experience, is the fact that what is on the screen does not change. Okay? It's the same thing on the screen. You are not changing anything. What keeps changing is your experience over time. It goes, sometimes it's this, sometimes it's that, this, that, and keeps on alternating. And this provides us an interesting way to study, and this is what we do here in this experiment I am going to show you, about how our experience of time changes using this particular stimulus. Okay? Now, there are theories about how this happens with respect to the brain. I know there are not many people who study the brain here. Uh, I will just briefly still mention terminology. Uh, there is something called, in the brain, what you can do if you measure, especially from outside the brain, are oscillations of different frequencies. Okay? And what do you have are different frequencies in different ranges. There is something called theta range, which is 4 to 8 hertz. There is something called gamma range, which is usually from 40 to 60 hertz. Okay? Now, these two oscillations, they are actually coupled with each other. Uh, they are hooked up. Think of them as two oscillators that are hooked up. They are coupled with each other. When they do it, you can see this is actually what is called a phase difference. If you have an oscillation, a sinusoidal wave, if you are done in school, you have what is called phase, the angle. right? And these two oscillations are either synchronized. In this case, the phase will be 0 or very low which is what happens here, when you are actually perceiving something. When you make a transition to another percept, it again happens here, but there is a small period of time, although it is stretched in this graph, where you actually make a switch. And it is not, while well, this diagram shows it happens instantaneously, in reality, it, it still takes a little bit of time. So, what we are actually interested in is how much time that is, okay? or how that affects our experience of time indirectly to say something about that. So, this thing, which essentially for some amount of time, they kind of go out of sync. These two oscillators go out of sync. So, they are in synchronization and then they go out of sync very briefly for a moment, you can think like that, and then they come back again because you have another experience. Now, this period is essentially what we want to focus on and how it affects our experience of time. Now, um, I won't go into too much detail with the, with the actual models and the hypothesis that each of these models predict. The, there are in time perception research, there are one class of models which are essentially what are called pacemaker accumulator models. The basic idea is very simple. You have a clock. The clock has a lot of pulses. You have an accumulator which essentially grabs these pulses. The more number of pulses you grab, it feels like it is more time. Less number of pulses you grab, it feels like less time. Okay? That is in, as, you know, simplistically that is what it is. They actually predict that if there is a perceptual switch in your experience, you see something and then you see something else, then in that case, you actually should have, when there is a switch that occurs and if there is a duration that in which that switch is occurring, then you should feel it as longer felt time. Okay? Time should expand. In intrinsic models of time based on coupling, which I just mentioned, 
if you have a period during a switch and in that switch the coupling is lost the prediction is opposite you will actually have contraction of time. So, the felt time should contract and there are models that produce that it would not make any difference ok, they essentially produce a null result. Essentially this is what we do, uh, you see this cube and I will show you a video of this. Um, you pass this rod through the cube in a way that it does not switch or sometimes it can switches. This is there is actually what is called a geometry violation here based on it it may not switch or it may switch and we ask people to estimate time there are 4 times that we use in the study 400 milliseconds, 800, 1200 and 1, 1600 milliseconds. So, 0.4 seconds to 1.6 seconds if, if you are interested in time. Can you play this video please? Oops, no, 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 no. Can you go back? Just go to the play somewhere there. Yes, thank you. Um, okay. So, just hold for a moment this in front. Okay. If that is the case, press again. For some of you when the rod passed through, I do not know now it is difficult to do this. Did it switch when the rod was passing through at least for one or two? Okay. Okay. So, that is it. So, some it depends on which orientation, which percept are you seeing. If you are seeing the cube one way it will not switch, if you are seeing the cube in the other way it will switch. What is happening on the screen is exactly the same thing, ok. Still there is nothing on the screen that is changing, but your experience either may change or may not change. So, we can look then at what is the difference when it changed versus when it did not change, ok. Next slide. So, this is what we do uh, and what you find is we ask people after this pass through we ask them to verbally give a number estimate the duration of how much time it took for the rod to pass through from left to right ok. We also ask them whether there is a switch in their experience or not. Remember this is in their experience not in the stimulus right. And what you see here is that at 3 durations here 400, 800 and 1600 when there is switched it is actually shorter than when it did not switch in their experience. So, when they had a switch in their perceptual experience the felt time contracted it was less ok. Uh, there was no difference here it is not important can you go to the next slide please. What we really do is actually this is what we do, we take each participant gives an estimate of these 4 durations, we fit it with a particular mathematical function for those who are interested in the math, I have given the function here, it comes from a particular model called a dual clepsydra model. But the basic idea is that you fit this function with a particular mathematical function this curve and you can estimate two parameters and you can see them here there is a parameter called eta, there is a parameter called k. The only interpretation of these two parameters is eta is something to do with uh, what is called an extrinsic parameter that is it is something about what happens think of it as outside. And k is a parameter it is something to do with what happens inside the system. So, think of it as something to do with the mind ok. So, k is an intrinsic in what we call an endogenous parameter to the system and eta is an extrinsic parameter. What we find is that this parameter k is different in the two conditions, which means that whatever is causing or related to this change in your experience of time is reflected by changes in k, which is something internal factor, a factor internal to the mind ok, it is an endogenous factor and that is linked to the way you experience in this case this particular Necker cube. Next please. Ok, so models that are based on clock uh, actually cannot explain these results and it does not account for phenomenology. Various more propositions like I am not I have not really defined them coherence intervals, cognitive cycles which are based on what we call the present moment right. There is always a present moment in your 
flow of experience. Um, William James called the species present. There are others who have different terminology. Um, they can predict and the phenomenologically the switches appear pretty immediate. When it switches, it looks like it switches instantaneously to you. However, it is not instantaneous. It still takes a little bit of time and you can see that kind of in this difference. Okay? In a sense, this difference reflects that time that actually takes to make the switch. Okay. So, the basic idea is this, when there is no, when there is a switch, initially you have one perceptual event, something you are experiencing, it switches into something else and here is where the switch occurs. When the switch does not occur, you have essentially one single continuous event and what happens in your experience is that the time it takes for the switch to occur, it is almost like it is deleted from your experience and because of that the felt time gets shorter. Okay? Next. Okay. So, well, sorry. Um, I am going to now look at one aspect of attention and how it affects time. Uh, tell me uh, I, how am I doing in terms of time? How much time has passed? 15 more minutes. 15 more minutes. Then I should wrap. Well, I should move on to the next section there. Okay. So, one of the things we study in terms of attention is essentially these using these kinds of stimuli. Uh, what is so nice about them? Well, you, you can see this is a big letter made up of small letters. Okay? So, this is well uh, the letter H in English and it is made up of uh, number 8. Okay? Now, this big letter is what we call global, the small letters are what we call local. The good thing about this is that we can simultaneously manipulate information at two different levels uh, and then see what happens. So, I can pay you, make you, ask you to pay attention to the big letter or I can ask you to pay attention to the small letters. Okay? And I can manipulate attention that way, either you focus on something which is small or which is something which is bigger. Okay. Um, you can present these stimuli for different durations, you can ask people to estimate and this is the function that you get. I mean, this is actually fitted with straight lines, this is not a straight line, it, I just joined by um, connecting line segments. But the basic idea is shown here. Okay. These are, by the way, this study was also done with people who meditate. Uh, these are concentrative uh, med meditation type meditators, particular type of meditation called the Sayad Samadhi meditation. Um, Let us just focus on non meditators first. What you see is a difference in slope. It is not very clear here um, because of the way this di figure is done, but it is clear here. So, if I ask you to pay attention to the global level, then the slopes of the function, which is this, the x axis is objective time that you manipulate, y axis is reported time by the participants. This is perception, this is think of it as the world. Um, there is a difference in slope between global and local. The global has a much higher slope than the local. So, the way in which your experience of time changes depends on whether your attention is local or global. Okay? That is the basic idea. Okay. Now, if you are a meditator, uh, you can see what happens. In this particular type of meditation, they concentrate their focus on a particular whatever, mantra or uh, object. So, what happens? The global does not change at all in this particular case. Uh, what happens here is the, the slope for local goes up. Now, there is no difference between local and global anymore. Both slopes are equal. Okay? So, whatever the difference is there between local and global in people who did not meditate kind of goes away here um, among meditators. Okay. The third thing which I will do it quickly and then move on to the last part is that even our intentions influence how we perceive time. Lot of time we want something to happen, right? Many of us want this to happen, that to happen in our life or certain events which we experience. 
The question is, what is the difference between events that you wanted to happen, you desired or you had an intention that it should happen versus events that happened which you did not intend, okay, which you did not desire. The basic idea is how does it change your experience of time for those events. Okay. There are other aspects which I will be happy to talk about um, offline. I um, will just go to the results simply because we are running out of time. Basically, it is to say you have an expansion of time. That is, if you get the desired event, whatever you desired, then time expands. If you get what you did not desire or what you did not like or whatever, time contracts. Okay? That is essentially the basic idea. Um, if you have a stimulus that is associated with yourself, so in the laboratory what we do is we simply associate say you with a circle. It is very arbitrary, people come into the lab, we just associate an arbitrary geometrical shape. It is like your name, people, your parents gave you something, arbitrary, right? Um, and then attach it, you just say these two go together, that is all it is. You train people for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, that is all you need to do. Then what you do is, you measure, you ask people to press a key, these shapes come and we, you ask people to estimate the time between when you press the key and when these shapes appeared on the screen, okay? That is the time you are estimating. And what do you find? If a particular shape is associated with yourself, you report that time to be shorter. Okay? If, if it is associated with you, essentially you feel it closer in time. If it is not associated with you, if the shape is associated with stranger, you report it to be farther away in time. Okay? So, the point the sum total of all this is essentially this, that various factors, whether it is they are factors which are part of this object or the stimulus or internal factors could be what you wanted, it, what you desired, how you pay attention and so on. All of these things influence how we perceive time. Okay. Um, okay so, there is very little Indian so far, this is the conference on Indian knowledge systems. So, finally, I kind of decided and uh, put something which is very important for Indian philosophy uh, and, and this is that is that the question is basically pretty simple, um, many most of you may be familiar with this question, is consciousness without content is possible. Now, a, there are a lot of signs and some philosophers would argue it is actually not possible. Um, in Indian philosophy, it is supposed to be possible, right? The earliest reference, as most of you are experts, uh, come from Mandukya Upanishads, where you have a description of the four states of consciousness, right? Uh, you have wakefulness, dreaming, and sleep. Uh, this is one particular translation, it does not matter whether this is exact translation. The only point I want to make is that this fourth, fourth state of consciousness, the Thuriya, is, is an empty state, right? It does not have any content. Uh, it is not supposed to have any content. So, the question is, is it possible? Does it even exist, right? Um, as a scientist, you are always taught first, you are a skeptic. So, you always ask the skeptic's question first. Does it exist? If it does not exist, well then we do not have to bother, we just simply then need to explain why people think it exists or why people experience. Remember, we are not talking about the experience per se. People may experience a conscious state as though it has no content. A skeptic will say, yeah, you did have that experience except that it is still an illusion. Okay? That is what a skeptic would say. And I will give you a skeptic's theory as well, and that comes from Thomas Metzinger, who is the philosopher. Um, so, if the question is, does Thuria exist at all, and can it be studied scientifically, if at all can be studied, or at least can we make sense of it, to or start making sense of it? If it does exist, then the question becomes, well, let us say it exists, then the question is, how do we study it? 
Of course, if you are a sage, you do not have to bother with this issue at all. You just have the experience and you are perfectly all right. Okay? Yeah, this does not apply, I do not know, to Ramana Maharishi. He would not care. But if you are in academics like us and we want to understand and explain it to a skeptic, then the question is, and if you want to study it, how do we study it? Can, is there ways of even approaching them? Forget about solving them. We are not, we are not, not even close. But the question is, how would we even, we even approach this? And all I am going to say is something about couple of ways in which you may try to approach it. Okay, that is all there is. But before we do that, so I will talk about two things. One is dreamless sleep experience. Uh, the second thing is essentially located in some relationship to properties of consciousness and the property that I have in mind is continuity and I will talk about that. This is the Aras model, so called Aras model by Metzinger and uh, this is a quote from his paper. There are some technical jargon here which is related to a particular part of the brain, the ascending reticular arousal system which is very important. If you knock it off, then you essentially, um, you, you, you are not, you become unconscious, you are in coma or whatever it might be the case, right. So, this is very critical. So, the minimal form of conscious experience is constituted by the content of a predictive model. The word here is predictive model and let me just give a brief background for those who may not be familiar. Majority of the models are, I mean, one, are one of the most popular models out there is the notion of the predictive mind. If you are talking of the mind, if you are talking of the brain, then it is the predictive brain. The basic idea is very simple. At every instant in time or every moment in time, your mind is always predicting what is going to come next. Okay? Then something happens, say in the, for now we will make it as an external perception, something happens in the world you get some information, you perceive something, then you compare the two, then there is an error. So, you expected something, you predicted, you got something, there is an error and this prediction error is what drives further what happens in the next moment and this goes on in time continuously. Okay? So, this notion of a predictive mind that it constantly predicting what is going to happen in the next moment, checking that whether the prediction was true. If there is an error, revise, keep doing forever I guess and this is in nutshell is what is meant by a predictive model or what underlies this. Okay? And the basic idea is that this ARA system determines the brain's general level of activation. So, essentially Metzinger argues that contentless consciousness is a skeptic on this, is an illusion and the pure conscious state actually has a non-conceptual representational content. Okay, so, this is philosophy. So, essentially is arguing that this particular pure conscious state still has content. The only claim he is making, yes, is that this particular content is non-conceptual representational content, but it still has some content. It is a special content but it is not contentless. It appears to you as though it is contentless. Okay? The non-conceptual content because it is non-conceptual represents empty or non-representational. Its peculiarity is that its content itself is emptiness okay? and that is the reason why if you experience this state, you report it to we have, oh there was nothing in my consciousness, it is empty. Okay? And Metzinger argues that contentless phenomenal state actually carries an abstract form of intentional content. Now, he goes through various properties of what is important to look at if you have a minimal phenomenal experience. I am not going to describe all of them, I am already told I'm, I have less time. Uh, but I will just say that there are many properties, tonic alertness, absence of intentional content or content of absence, self luminosity, introspective availability, epistemicity and transparency. Okay? So, I am just reading it. If you want to talk about any of them, we will talk later. And what Metzinger has done is for various states of consciousness going from normal waking here, 
full absorption, lucid dreams, lucid dreamless sleep, dream sleep, deep sleep, minimally consciousness state. You can then make a matrix of these six properties. You can think of them as properties. And the, if the color is dark, that means you can think of it as more or less. Okay? And that is present or absent if you want to make it as a dichotomy. And this gives you an idea of how to compare different states of consciousness according to him. Okay. So, essentially the idea is that this minimal phenomenal experience is actually, you, you have a causal model of this RS set up in the system as a predictive model uh, of the RS signal and that model because it is hidden and that is the reason why the state, this particular state of consciousness has this feeling of emptiness that it has no content. Okay. That is his explanation or a proposal. Okay. What are the closed states of consciousness without any content? Of course, when we are normally awake, right now you are all seeing me, so your conscious experience has some content, right? You are seeing me or you are hearing me or whatever. Um, one place it shows up both in scientific research as well as in Indian philosophy is what happens to your consciousness in sleep, right? Many of you who, are interest, who have interest in Indian philosophy, there has been debates about what happens to your consciousness when you are asleep. Does it, it is there or it is not there. Um, so, the dreamless sleep experience is something that you can describe as a pure temporal experience and there are ways and means people have started studying in the lab uh, dreamless sleep experience. And the claim is that it has no intentional content, but there is of course, you know, I mean this particular one which I read and discussed in the literature a bit more is the debate between Nyaya and Advaita about what happens during sleep, right. The only point I have put here is that, um, and somebody can correct me if I am wrong, um, Nyaya does not allow objectless cognitive states. Uh, so, you still have to have content. So, this issue is a bit tricky. Uh, for Advaita, of course, it is not a problem. So, when you have a dreamless sleep experience, then you do not have a sense of self at all, presumably, or at least you, you do not experience it explicitly. There seems to be a phenomenon now, and this is argument made by Jennifer Wendt, um, and the recognition of the absence is based on what is called retentional aspects of the now. This is a kind of technical term actually comes from, uh, it is in the Indian philosophy debate, it is usually couched in terms of memory. Uh, in Western phenomenology debates, it is usually couched in terms of pretension and retention. So, if you have a now, the current now of your experience, it has some kind of a trail on both sides. This trail on this back end, think of it as a plane which has some smoke going behind. Okay? That trail is what is called the retentional aspect. And the argument is that you do not have any experience here, but this retention, this kind of tail here, which essentially then tells you Oh, consciousness was actually present here. Okay. Anyway, um, in terms of continuity, there has been uh, a debate. Uh, uh, well, um, with everybody, but uh, what I have put here between two Buddhist schools, right? Now, interestingly, Buddhists actually argued for discrete moments of experience. So, for them, consciousness is discrete; it's not continuous. Okay. You have various, and of course, they had a calculation as well, lots of moments, very brief, whether the, those particular calculations are right or wrong, it is not an issue. But the basic idea is that the moments of experience themselves are discrete, but it raises a particular question though, and the question uh, is put here. How consciousness managed to function coherently given that it is gappy, it has gaps, it may be very small gap. If consciousness is strictly momentary in the sense that there is no consciousness whatsoever that persists during the gaps, then what accounts for its coherent functioning not only from moment to moment, but also across longer stretches of time. Okay. For example, what accounts for longer lasting traits of consciousness such as the attentional stability arising from meditation practice? Why do not the gaps between moments of awareness disturb these continuities? Okay. Uh, this particular quote comes from an interesting book I would recommend uh, by Yvonne Thompson called Waking, Dreaming and Being. 
which talks a lot about both science and Indian philosophy. And this is the last slide I have. It, how, how do we address this? Now, for the Buddhists, if it is discrete, you need a way of somehow connecting it, right? What happens in the gaps question has to be answered. One possible way to answer it is to propose this notion of active versus passive consciousness. So, the passive consciousness, which presumably, the, which provides the basis of continuity of individual, uh, sometimes it is translated as life continuum or fact of existence or bhavanga. Uh, and the basic idea is that this passive consciousness is something that is there. And the whatever your experience is, is it's like multiplexing for those of you who are familiar with engineering. It's kind of laid on top of it. And then what you have is the sum total of the two. Okay. It's essentially something like that. The Yogacharas actually proposed Alaya Vijnana and that is supposed to be continuously present all the time. So, both of them propose something that is present all the time, something that is momentary. And what you eventually end up experiencing is a kind of combination of the two. And what is continuous, right, is essentially the, it is a state, well this is possible, I am just now hypothesizing, uh, without content. The contents are discreetly coming and jumping here and then they get added to what is contentless. Think of it as a river with some stones in it, okay. With, okay. So, this notion, this debate about continuity versus discrete is a very prominent debate in the science as well, right. Uh, people have been debating whether conscious experience is really continuous or really discrete. This goes back to debates in physics as well, for those of you who know whether it is continuous or discrete. We have ended up with quantum mechanics which actually says it is all discrete, at least at the quantum mechanical level, even though this looks continuous to you. If you are a, according to physics, it is actually discrete. There are gaps there, which is not visible here, right. So, you have quanta. So, whether the underlying reality itself is continuous or discrete, it is up in the air, we will continue to debate it. But the continuity property in as so far as we can bring it to the lab and if we can measure or distinguish between continuity and discreteness, that may provide a way of answering this debate about consciousness without content as well, or at least that is what I think. Okay? So, let me just conclude, various aspects, conscious content, attention, intentions, self-association, they all influence how we experience time and the presence of contentless state of consciousness has very, it is actually very important for all theories of consciousness, whether in philosophy or in science. Uh, the functional theories of consciousness the positions for like functionalism will not allow contentless states of consciousness in science as well. Um, and we would need novel paradigms to study and theorize about it. And of course, it seems like if you actually realize such a state, it does seem to change people's life. People do report it. And this is the only thing I have about it. something to do with well-being, okay, since I, I saw consciousness and well-being. Um, and we do need to measure the impact this has on the realization has on your day to day life. And that is another way we can still study it, it probably in an indirect way of studying it. But I still think that is important as well. Okay. Um, let me thank all my students. Uh, they are the ones who do all the work and I just talk about it. So, this is kind of a bit of opposite of what people have been doing. The, these are these are the ones that I want to acknowledge, not my gurus, my students. They do all the work and uh, I get some credit. So, Ishan Singhal who did the perceptual switch experiment, Amrinder Singh who had done studies on meditators and Mukesh who had done studies on intentions and all that. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, yeah, the forum is now open for questions. Well, there are hands. <laughs> uh, 
Hi. Good morning, sir. Hi. Thank you for the lovely presentation. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, I had a question about the verbal estimation that you presented. Mm -hmm. So, has there any study being done about how the difference in the estimation and the psychological condition of the mind and the correlation between that? Because uh, I wanted to know about that. Well, all the things I just presented are psychological conditions of the mind. Uh, no, as in uh, if they are suffering from any illness and... Oh, it does. It does affect. So, um, something that I do not study. Uh, hmm. So, a lot of people have shown that uh, if you have various disorders, your perception of time also changes. Um, just a quick out the top of my head, uh, for example, ADHD children, hmm. uh, they have uh, a changed uh, sense of time as well. Okay. Uh, many, schizophrenia, depression. I mean, pretty much every disorder uh, changes uh, your sense of time as well. So, uh, like, uh, I wanted to know, like, whether this can be also used as a tool to, you know, like, identify whether... Some do it. Some do it already. Okay. Uh, some, there has been work on using it as a tool uh, as well. Mm. Um, I mean, if you write to me, I can point out to something later. Sure. Um, but, yes. Thank you, sir. Yeah. That's it. Thanks very much for wonderful presentation. Uh, so good morning. <laughs> I would like to uh, clarify this uh, confusion between consciousness and awareness. Consciousness and? Awareness. Conscious one minute, one minute. Uh -huh. Let me spell out what I mean by sure. that. The presence or absence of consciousness is what makes a person alive or a dead body. It is the precondition for the possibility of any kind of awareness or experience, Jagrat, Swapna, Sushupti or Turiya, Turiya, Tita, whatever, the different levels of consciousness. Now, if we take the Advaita position, awareness is there because wherever the mind is present, Wherever the mind acts, we have the triputi samvit, knower, known, knowledge, distinction. Mm -hmm. I'm the perceiving subject, nyata, neya, the screen, and the resulting knowledge, jnana. So yeah. this triad, these three categories are present wherever the mind is present. So whether it is jagrat or swapna, jagrat or swapna, dream, waking or uh, dream, uh, dream state, the objects in the waking state are outside us. In the wake, uh, dream state, they are mental projections. Whatever uh, is uh, latent impressions in the mind, they get projected as dream objects. But this triple factor can be discerned. There is the knower who is perceiving the dream and uh, you are able to recount the mm -hmm. dream experience mm -hmm. after coming to Jagrat state. But <coughs> what happens in Sushupti is the mind, the mind relapses, reverses from the efficient state. Ka, uh, karya avastha to the Karna avastha, causal state which is Avidya. Therefore, this triune is not functioning because the mind is not functioning as the mind. It goes back to the causal uh, condition. Madam, uh, may I please interrupt? Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, I guess please ask your a, question. What's the question? Yeah, yeah. Not question. I'm just giving the clarification that there should be no confusion between yeah, consciousness I think, uh, and awareness. Thank you, madam. I think we can do this offline. Awareness possible. So whenever the mind relapses, it goes back to the causal condition. Yeah. There is no object experience. Yeah, madam. So that does not mean it is contentless. Co that is the evidence. Sushupti evidence is the proof that there is yeah. contentless. Co madam, Sushupti. we are really running out of time. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, <coughs> thanks very much for our exciting, stimulating presentation. In that uh, <laughs> matrix which is being shown, mm. uh, Maybe you can hypothesize, and this is my question, I would like to pursue that, uh, unresponsive wakefulness syndrome, mm -hmm. and uh, then the minimally conscious state. Mm. I think these, uh, these, are being these are being classified as two, 
but with my little experience of some uh, sadhana a little bit of thanks to my mentors and gurus even the unconscious experience is of the different variety and so for example if someone does soham sadhana there is a certain type of experience which is for a common person lay person who is not trained in the cognitive science would say it's a contentless transcendental meditation will have a certain deeper type of uh, another type of contentlessness the shunya meditation will have a very very different type of experience so no, there, there is a possibility uh -huh. of like further refining this classification there might be some some clarity experience. see the issue is this right if you want to give a typology of contentless states normally the typology we give about our experiences is actually based on content so, for example, how do you distinguish between a visual experience and an auditory experience? Well, because the visual experience has visual content, the auditory experience is auditory content. It is actually the differences in content which enables you to classify them as different kinds of experience. Okay? Similarly, the kind of content in dream is different from the kind of content that is present when you are wakeful. Again, the differences in content is, is there, right? So, for example, I can fly in dreams, but I cannot have a flying experience. I, I fully appreciate this logic. So, all I am saying is, if you postulate that there are different types of contentless states, but still they do not have content, then the difference has to come from something else. Unless we can clearly say what that something else and we can… Capture that. Capture that. Yes. That, of course… So, uh, just my, right. yeah, so yeah. my hypothesis is the difference if we are seeing from the Manomaya Kosh and Vijnanamaya Kosh perspective, there is a problem. But if we look at the Pranamaya Kosh, the continuity is, might be because of the Pranamaya Kosh, may not be from the Manomaya and Vijnanamaya Kosh. Except that you need to come up with a way to study and of show course. it to the skeptics. Yes, but before any measurement, That's we need to I have mean. a hypothesis uh, sure. and conjecture. It's possible. I am just I conjecturing. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yes. Uh, I mean, Thank we you. have to conjecture. We have time for a last yes. question. One question. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much, Professor, for a wonderful uh, presentation on the core questions on consciousness and how we can study it scientifically. Uh, I have two questions, Professor. One is your Necker Cube experiment. Was it done on meditators or normal subjects? Is it so I am particularly interested that is it possible to have a delayed switch? In, in case you have been training your attention, because when meditators attend and they say one-pointedness, what they are trying to do is to s not switch. Basically, they are not, they are trying to not switch consciously in their internal objects. So, that's one question. Sh shall I answer it? Uh -huh. or, okay. And so, this uh -huh. particular experiment we have not done with meditators. Uh -huh, okay. okay. So, this one is, we just wrote okay. this paper up, we just completed it. Right. Uh, but, we have done um, Necker cube experiments with meditators hmm. uh, as well as non-meditators and what we have done is that we essentially uh, present well the Necker cube stays on the screen and people keep reporting uh, switches. switches. And then what we have found is that you can, by the way, this switching is something that can be controlled voluntarily, even huh. by us. Huh. We don't, I mean, those of us who are not expert meditators, huh. even we can do that. Huh. But of course, meditators can both hold it for a longer period of time, right. as well as make it switch faster as well. Hmm. So they can do both. Hmm. This is what the data that we have shows. So, in that sense, meditators are, are better able to control this their switch. experience. Mm. This particular experiment is, we, we have not done with meditators, which hopefully I think we will do eventually. Thank okay. you. My second question is, what does Metzinger say? Elaborate on non-conceptual, repre non-representation, what he says. Non-conceptual representational content. Huh. Okay. What so, does that mean? Well, the the issue about uh, in uh, theories of perception is that what kind of a content it is. So, uh, for those who are not familiar with this, there is something about uh, conceptual content 
uh, for loose way of talking about it, think uh, simply think like things that you can put on words. It is not a great way to define it, but for now I will survive with it. And non conceptual contents are not concepts. So, they are still content, but they are not concepts. Uh, Indian philosophy as well as other western philosophy allows for non conceptual content. There has been a long debate about whether all content is conceptual or not. But Singer argues this particular state has non conceptual. If it is conceptual, then uh, it is a problem for him, because then it people will be able to report about it in principle. So, he has to make it non conceptual in, in his model. We can talk more later. Yeah, Thank you, sir. So I am sure that uh, after such a uh, stimulating uh, talk, there are many people who have questions. I request them to have this question and answer session after the after this session. We are really running out of time. I thank Professor Narayanan for uh, this wonderful presentation, and I request uh, Dr. Gauri Mahuli Karji, yeah, to honor the speaker and present him uh, with a token of gratitude on behalf of Chinmay Vishwamitra. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. The next session is a panel discussion which will start immediately. Thank you.